there was a very tough sergeant and, and he was hit and he was hit badly and he was in great pain and he was wailing and crying, crying for his mother, mummy. And uh, this absolutely shook me to hear this man who I'd always rather regard as a tough, hard case, um, wailing and, and moaning for his mummy. Twenty years after the First World War, a new generation faced the stress and terror of modern battle. Once again, combat would take men's minds to extreme limits. But this time, new efforts would be made to treat the mental casualties of war and get them fighting again. Army psychiatrists believed complete recovery was now possible. But first, they had to try untested and controversial treatments, from massive doses of new drugs to electric shock. The secrets of the mind were to be opened up to science in the service of the military. Das ist die Straße nach Dünkirchen. In panischem Schrecken ließ die Engländer alles stehen und liegen und eilten in wilder Flucht zur Kanalküste. 200,000 British soldiers had their first experience of battle in early 1940. Driven back by the Germans across northern France, they were cut off at Dunkirk. Trapped on the beach, troops waited desperately for a place on the evacuating boats. Many were raw recruits, driven to the point of breakdown by fear and panic. We was terrified. There was nowhere to hide. You thought you could get into the dunes, but the bombs were dropping everywhere. And some of them just laid down on the sand. So they kept saying, we should never see England, we should never see England again. I used to say, oh, come on, let's try once more to get to the boats. But I knew it was hopeless trying to get to the boats because uh, we could see the bodies in the, in the sea. And that's, I think that's what made them crack up as well, seeing the bodies. Everywhere around you, there were bodies. In the days after Dunkirk, the shattered men straggled back to the south coast ports. There were just convoys and convoys of them. Some arrived on stretchers. They arrived clad in whatever they could find, really. Some of them had semi-uniform, anything that the people had given them. Some had their uniforms all in tatters. They were grimy, dirty shaking, unable to speak, rambling, some of them. Thousands of soldiers were in such a state of shock that they had hysterical symptoms. They were blind, shaking, paralyzed or mute. Unable to take any more, their minds had shut down their bodies. The army was prepared for the physically wounded, but not for these men. Stan Goldsworthy had the symptoms later. Well, I was sort of very anxious and very anxious and sort of thing. I'd lost my speech, quite a bit of my speech at the time. And uh, all sort of you had nightmares. It was right in the daytime, but at night, as soon as you dropped off to sleep, all these things reoccurred in your mind. And you got this, this hot sweats, so you got very hot and sort of clammy. And then it woke you up and you couldn't get any sleep for the rest of the night then, you see. The army had forgotten the lessons of the First World War, that battle can drive men mad. After 1918, a government inquiry into shell shock had recommended that all army doctors be trained in psychoneurosis and new recruits screened in order to weed out those most likely to break down. But the report had been ignored. 
1939, the army had only six medical officers trained in psychiatry. The military felt that uh, good men, well-trained, well-officered, uh, wouldn't break down in large numbers. They felt that maybe breakdown was something that happened in the past. Uh, it wouldn't happen again because under their sort of leadership and training, etc., that men would in future resist the stresses and strains of, of battle. Totally unprepared for the flood of traumatized men, the army had to commandeer civilian mental hospitals. As a result, Dunkirk soldiers found themselves on a new front line, caught between competing ideas of how they should be treated. The psychiatric establishment believed psychoanalysis was the answer, the so-called talking cure, but it wasn't practical to psychoanalyze thousands of distraught soldiers. Younger psychiatrists wanted to try faster, more direct methods, using physical treatments. The most radical of these doctors at Sutton Hospital in Surrey was William Sargent. He dismissed psychoanalysis as useless talk when action was needed. He wanted to try drugs. Sargent gave the soldiers massive doses of sodium amytal, a new sedative. The idea was to break the vicious circle of exhaustion and anxiety by putting them into a deep sleep that could last three weeks. I walked in, I, I could see them all there lying in these beds, all receiving this stuff they called jungle juice, which is a treatment to put you into a twilight world. And they were all like sort of zombies laying in the bed, you know, all laying and nobody spoke and looked at you. So I thought, well, this is it, this sort of thing. If I got to be like this, I don't want to be in here. But but you had to stay there because you were in the army and that was all I was about it. He used to do this deep narcosis treatment. He'd keep them asleep for weeks on end and they would just be woken up for an hour a day, you know, to be fed and washed and, and all that sort of thing. He did that a lot. He had a whole ward of them, which was quite creepy, I found, quite creepy when I went there to find all these people sound asleep with darkness. And it's a bit like that... Um, um, nocturnal animal part of the zoo where you know everything's dark they make it night and it's really day a bit like that his theory was that when they came out of this deep sleep treatment that they were better and I think some of them were Sergeant believed in what he called heroic doses the usual error he said was to give too little he made a film about the methods he was pioneering Sergeant's hospital footage is a unique record of wartime medicine. A different drug, insulin, helped soldiers gain weight and so restore them physically. But the treatment had dangers. Insulin induced a coma by lowering the blood sugar level. If it dropped too far, the consequence was irreversible brain damage and even death. Sergeant used drugs not just to make his patients sleep and eat, but to make them talk. With drugs, they were made to recall the experiences that had triggered their breakdown. The idea was that once the terrible event had been uncovered, the men would get better. The treatment was for the most severe shock cases, where men had lost their memory or power of speech. I couldn't speak, I couldn't say thank you, I couldn't say anything. Whether I was frightened to speak, whether I, I don't know. Not to this day, I don't know. But I, I just 
as you did and I tried to come out. John Hanstock became a casualty while serving in the Navy. The traumatic experiences that led to his breakdown came in the Mediterranean. Month after month, his ship was attacked by German and Italian planes. After the death of his closest friend, he was close to cracking up, but for weeks tried to conceal his despair. Things seemed to be coming to a head. I was feeling this can't go on, uh, uh, you know, the, it just can't go on this. I thought no one else knew. But the captain had noticed that there was something wrong. John Hanstock was ordered to report to the ship's doctor. He came to me, and you looked in my eyes. Nothing, lad. I, I couldn't bear it at all. A kind word, I'd not had a kind word. Nobody does any forces. They don't know such thing as kind words. And the floodgates. And I cried as my mother would have seen me cry as a child. Following his breakdown, John Hanstock was treated by narcoanalysis as pioneered by Sargent. Men were given lower doses of the sedative drugs in pill form. The drugs opened up their unconscious minds and they began to talk without any inhibition. Servicemen called it the truth drug. Doctor, he said to me, I want you to tell me things about your service. And he said, I'm going to relax you and give you this pill. And my word, talk, I did. You've no control over the power of this drug you're taking. And you just talk. You just talk because you're asked to talk, and you talk. There's no sort of dodging it. When I came out of the... Oh, it was wonderful. I was cleansed. It was clean. It was clear. I hadn't a bad... I hadn't... It was marvellous. I had absolutely no anxiety. Most doctors used the new drug simply to provoke what they called an abreaction, the sudden cathartic release of buried emotions. But Sargent was more ambitious. He led his patients on, making them relive each stage of their experience and directing their emotions to a new conclusion. The soldier would start telling his story about how he, his friend had been blown up and blown all over him. Um, the sergeant would introduce the idea of, of uh, the dreadful machine gunner who had done it. Um, and instead of the, all the anger and fear free, floating around sort of rather aimlessly, it would be directed against the, the wicked German. The patient would scream or shout or be very distressed shake from head to foot all of these symptoms which had not been released without the drug it would be quite a noisy session and then at the end of it he would so, so, so the soldier would, would be exhausted and collapse back and sergeant would then tell him that he was in control and that he'd uh, been a brave man who had overcome the the enemy so that he was he was his morale was restored that was really the object of the reaction before the war, these men might have ended up in an asylum. Their improvement seemed to vindicate all sergeants' claims for physical treatments.
you can regard those patients as guinea pigs. Uh, in a way, all patients are guinea pigs. Medicine and psychiatry is very much a hit and miss affair. Um, and yes, of course, if you have suddenly have a war and a lot of soldiers who are damaged, you, you, you are. This is a new situation, and so you can call it guinea pigs if you like. Um, but nobody really knew what to do. The disaster of Dunkirk forced the army to confront the problem of mental breakdown. From now on, they had to plan for it. Some of the men who had broken down should never have been sent to war in the first place. So the army looked again at the way it selected soldiers. The very first psychological tests were introduced to probe recruits' personality and intelligence. Which horse will be harder to hold? A, B, or the same? Which weighs more? A, B, or equal? Men considered vulnerable to stress were weeded out and given non-fighting jobs. 200 psychiatrists were recruited and given the rank of major. They tried to get involved in not just treating the sick, but every part of army life, training, officer selection, discipline and morale. But the new experts met resistance. There was a fair amount of surprise and jealousy, perhaps, at the growing influence of psychiatry uh, in the army, because before the army, psychiatry was regarded as one of the Cinderella uh, specialties. And this was quite a shock, I think, to many people in the Corps. So there was, there was a considerable resistance to this intrusion, as they felt, of psychiatry into a, a soldier's business, not a doctor's business. Suspicion of the shrinks went right to the top. Even the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was concerned, telling the War Office, it would be sensible to restrict as much as possible the work of these gentlemen who are capable of doing an immense amount of harm. It is very wrong to disturb large numbers of normal, healthy men by asking odd questions. You married a widow? Yes, sir. I see. How old is your stepdaughter? Twenty years old, sir. Twenty years old. Yes. Uh, had her father been dead for a long time? That's why he was killed, sir. So that your wife would draw a pension? Yes, sir. Until she decided that you were better than a pension? The squad's view of uh, psychiatry was, was, was a fairly ribald one, I would say, that, that there was a general kind of, of, of myth uh, operating almost from the moment I got into the army about working your ticket. It was a great way to work your ticket to fool the trick cyclists, and it was a very easy thing to do, you just pretend you're mad. Um, in practice, I don't believe it was an easy thing to do. Yes. But despite the scepticism, the Army's pioneering commitment to psychiatry and psychology was pursued with vigor. Then Poole. Poole is an odd sort of man. In civilian life, he was very badly adjusted, in the personal sense, that is. He just couldn't mix, couldn't make friends. Psychiatrists sifted through those already in the ranks, moving vulnerable soldiers to more suitable jobs. With a desperate shortage of manpower, they tried to ensure no one's skills were wasted. Just couldn't make it. At 4.30 in the morning, Montgomery launched his attack on Akarit, an artillery barrage which outclassed the preliminary attacks on Alamein and Maurit. At the battlefronts, Army commanders felt they had more immediate things to worry about. In North Africa, the 8th Army had begun to drive Rommel's men back across the desert. Some generals refused to have psychiatrists with them, regarding them as fifth columnists, who'd only reduced the number of fighting soldiers available. And officers still found it hard to tell shirkers from the genuinely battle shock. As the campaign gathered momentum, the mental endurance of newly trained British troops was put to the test. Raw, primitive, atavistic fear 
comes when you are actually in an attack and people around you are being killed or maimed and in very unpleasant ways and that you are likely to be and this fear is monstrously engulfing and it is personal and it is demoralizing and it is dehumanizing and it is in a sense shameful because you know I think you know that you would do anything really to 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 escape from from this monster Vernon Scannell was 18 when he was called up after five months of artillery and tank attacks, he was reaching his limits. Our job was to go forward under cover of night, and we dug in at the foot of this range of hills, and as it got light, the rest of the brigade passed through us and put in this attack. We went up the hill shortly after they put in the attack, and they were simply mowed down because it was daylight. It was partly because these men, we'd actually seen them, they'd passed through our positions as they were going up, and we'd sort of exchanging uh, badinage, and up they'd gone, and there they all were. And then I saw that a lot of our people, my own unit, my own friends, my own common, were going around looting these bodies. And why it should be worse to loot your own dead than the enemy, which I'd seen uh, umpteen times taking watches and things off, off dead uh, Germans and Tanners. Why it should be worse taking off their own men, but it was somehow. And I don't know, I, I sort of thought, uh, I can't take any more of this. And I turned around and walked away. I was simply sick of them, of me, of it, of everything. I was simply sick of the whole thing. Sick of, of what people are, what, what humans can do. I, I hadn't planned it. In a sense, it seemed outside my control. strangely dreamlike and when I remember it I seem to be floating along rather than walking I just carried on walking and walked and walked and walked and walked and covered something like 100 miles I got back to Tripoli which is a long long way from where we were before I was picked up by red caps jeep came up and bundled me into it and took me off and I was quite marshalled and, and sent and to uh, three years, three years hard labor, it was. Scannell's temporary breakdown was interpreted as desertion. There was no psychiatric examination at his trial. The North Africa campaign produced the highest rates of breakdown and desertion since Dunkirk. Some generals were so dismayed at the threat to discipline they asked that the right to shoot deserters be restored to them as a deterrent to others. But army psychiatrists had now concluded that after five days and nights of continuous bombardment, any soldier would break down. Instead of shell shock, they used a new term, battle exhaustion. It encouraged the idea that the condition was temporary. If men were simply rested, they could recover and carry on fighting. And army officers were taught to recognize the signs of stress. Sandy, that fellow rag of yours will be back in a day or two. Oh. He was a pretty good soldier, wasn't he, until he cracked up? Yes, until he cracked up. But when a good soldier goes to pieces like that, well, there must have been a yellow streak in him somewhere. Sandy, you're probably a very good soldier yourself, but uh, you're a bloody bad doctor. Under certain circumstances, any man will crack up. Particularly if he's got some... some private worry. 
Well, had he any private worry? Well, you should know. You're his platoon commander. produced its own unique stresses. But the RAF met them with a steelier approach than the army. With casualty rates so high, any notion that each man might have a breaking point was taboo. There could be no backsliding. Nobody had quite realized what a deadly business being air crew was, what the expectation of life was, or death. David Stafford Clark was a medical officer with Bomber Command. It was part of his job to look out for signs of stress in the crews. The best way I can estimate the survival rate was by saying that it was generally understood, never really mentioned, except among friends and in private, that the they had a one in four chance of surviving. They lived from day to day. They knew that they, next week when I go on leave, was never said because next week hadn't come yet. Can I start the flight, Skipper? Yes, okay. To fulfill the basic requirement, crews had to complete a tour of 30 bombing missions. If they survived that long, Many were then expected to do a second tour, and the chances of seeing it through dropped still further. Arthur Smith joined the RAF in 1942 when he was 18 and became a bomb aimer. The fear of flying was never talked about in my experience, and I would never have dreamed of saying I was afraid or didn't want to do this because I'd be letting my crew down. Uh, this sort of personal feelings of that sort wasn't natural to talk about them to each other. You certainly realize that you weren't the only one that was frightened. Uh, quite obviously, other people were frightened. Um, some people could bottle it up better than others. For some men, the near certainty of death became unbearable. But if they showed any signs of wavering, they were classified as LMF, lacking in moral fiber. An RAF order set out what would happen to them. If the Air Force decide that an individual must be categorized as lacking in moral fiber, there will be no question of his being given an opportunity to rehabilitate himself his services will be dispensed with. It was an administrative label. Instead of saying, you haven't got the gut, you're yellow or anything, it was LMF. Stigmatized them as cowards. They would have done 10 trips. Nobody who'd done 10 trips could have been a coward. I mean, a coward wouldn't have done more than one. Arthur Smith had flown 20 missions but the tension was beginning to take its toll. It was a night trip, very sticky target. The opposition from fighters and flak was expected to be very tough. It was then that I said to myself, I don't think I can go on this. I said it to myself, not to anybody else. I thought I must stop now. I still didn't have the courage to say to anybody, my crew member or to anybody, I can't go on this trip, I don't want to fly anymore. So I just went on, we went in the aircraft. Okay, chaps, here we go. When your morale goes, everything about your nervous system changes. You become, as it were, as though you were dying inside. You stop hoping, you stop expecting that you'll survive, and at the same time you, you can't get out of whatever your job is because uh, 
There is no way out. You've volunteered for it, you've got to do it. I worked myself up into such a frenzy, apparently, that when we got up in the air, I'd, I just found I couldn't do anything, I couldn't talk. I thought it in my own thought, I thought, this is it. I, I can't do it. This is me telling myself I can't fly anymore. Hello, Rear Gunner. Can you hear me? My navigator, Mac, he realised something was very wrong because I wasn't doing anything and I wouldn't speak to him and I, I was shaking a bit, I believe. So he um, said to the skipper on the intercom, there's something wrong with Smithy Wag. I don't know what, he can't do anything, he's ill some way. And uh, after a little while longer, they said, well, we'd better turn back. So back they came. And when we landed, the medical officer came along and he obviously examined me, found nothing physically wrong. And I said, I don't want to fly anymore. And then, of course, that was it. I was sent back to my billet to pack my kit. I wasn't allowed contact with anybody at, at all. No goodbye to my crew or anything. And a sergeant service police came along took me into a covered wagon and drove me away to I know not where. The authorities believed that LMF could be contagious. Arthur Smith was taken away to another base where he was interviewed by a psychiatrist. He told me exactly what would happen to me. I'd be stripped of my rank, lose my flying pay, be sent away to another station to do some menial job. Everybody would know what I'd done. My family would know what I'd done. And I realised that I'd be branded a coward for the rest of my life, and the thought of this was absolutely shattering. Arthur Smith was one of the few to be offered a second chance, despite the official ruling. The psychiatrist telephoned his station to see if he could go back. My commanding officer said yes, if his crew will have him. So then straightway phoned up my pilot on the squadron in the office while I was still in the interview and my pilot had a very quick talk with the rest of the crew who must have been with him at the time. And they said, yes, 100%, they all want you back. So, I'll come you back. Between 1943 and 1944, over 3,000 airmen were stripped of their rank and branded LMF. Arthur Smith went on to complete his 30 missions. In 1945, he was commended for bravery after saving one of his crew from a burning plane. In 1942, the army decided it needed its own special psychiatric hospital attuned to military needs. They took over an old Victorian lunatic asylum near Birmingham and sent their own staff to run it. They believed civilian hospitals were not returning enough soldiers to the front. Northfield was to be different. Organized on the principle that once men had physically recovered, they should be treated as soldiers, not psychiatric patients, however emotionally battle-scarred they might be. It was a regime not of drugs, but of therapeutic confrontation. One psychiatrist who developed this new approach was Lieutenant Colonel Tom Main. His theory was that the army allowed no place for grief. Main believed that in order to recover, soldiers had to be made to grieve by whatever means. He would take risks. He would, for example, allow a person to feel just what a rat he was and to bring him down almost to a point where the patient himself would either go under, as some did, or else of his own volition he'd begin to say, look, I'm not this bad, for God's sake, you know, I'm not what you're making out to be. And then, of course, the turnabout would be in the patient, because it was needed within him, 
uh, would, um, well, repair himself. Vernon Scannell, who'd been sentenced to hard labour, later met men treated by Colonel Maine. Tom Maine maintained that those soldiers in charge of, of a tank crew who'd lost their tank and their crews, and they had been sole survivors and were showing an unwillingness to return to, to battle, he said that they had insufficiently mourned the death of their crew, which sounds to me like total nonsense. He would then unbelievably lock them up into cells with only, I think, uh, an hour or so of, of artificial light uh, daily, in darkness otherwise, and I think put them on bread and water, the sort of punishment diet, uh, the way that the worst criminals are treated in military prisons. But there were less threatening forms of treatment at Northfield. Art therapy was pioneered by Sergeant Lawrence Bradbury. He encouraged soldiers to confront their hidden feelings of shame, guilt or despair. The aim was emotional release, with paint, not drugs. It was in miniature a therapeutic unit and the paintings that were produced there, some of them very, really very interesting and brilliant, but it helped if it were a success, it probably was in, on occasions, it was the doing of these things, bringing up into the conscience what otherwise would be haunting and festering behind. So instead of diverting their attention, as occupational therapy aimed to do, they were allowed there to face up, even though the grieving could sometimes be heart-rending. In other hospitals, progressive doctors were beginning to experiment with another, more hands-on approach to mental illness. There was a little uh, a cleaner in the ward, and she used to take a great deal of pleasure in saying, treatment day to day, oh dear, and the beds were all moved up till we were touching each other with the head to the centre. So on my head, I was back like this, to the centre of the ward. And then you heard the people coming along, the doctor, the sister, and another uh, nurse, a staff nurse. They came one by one, and you hear this activity, something on a trolley. Electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, had first been used in Italy. Many hospitals in Britain had forbidden experiments with it, but the war opened the way. Two pads were put on the patient's forehead and a controlled shock given to induce an epileptic fit. No one really knew how it worked, but it seemed to relieve chronic depression. I stood at the head of the patient and put the gag in place to stop them from biting their tongue or ingesting their teeth. If, they, if their teeth met the two sets, they might break. And then I immerse the electrodes in saline solution, I plugged in the apparatus and handed them to the doctor. And then they come to you. Now then, Mr. Hanstock, uh, we're, going, we're going to just lay back gently like that. We'll just put these on your head. You feel the damp of the thing on like that. You had no idea what was going to happen. Nobody told you anything at all. And then these figures all came out of the darkness of this room towards you. And that was it. You remembered no more at all. In those days, that was given straight. They didn't have any muscle relaxants like they do now. So it was really quite dangerous and quite dramatic. They would give them a shock and they'd leap up in the air and arch their backs and have a full epileptic fit and sometimes fracture their spines and things. So it was very dramatic.
You could hear the bones cracking, and they just went off like pistol shots. I mean, you be, won't be sleeping in your bed tonight. <laughs> and then you say to the nurse, uh, when am I going to have the treatment? He loves, she says, you've had it. This is the strange thing about it. And many, many people I've asked about this have said exactly the same thing. When am I going to have the treatment? And to be quite honest, it did the trick. But it was a most difficult thing to go through with. I think, as I say, the thing I should never forget is these figures coming towards you, ready to grab you. They did it to far too much and chose a lot of patients that weren't suitable. But when, it, when you have a patient that has a particular sort of deep depression or something and to see them come out of it so quickly instead of lying there for six months or something, it is a very remarkable treatment. But it, it's hazardous and a lot of people are not very good at choosing the patients. The war was providing an unprecedented testing ground. Psychiatrists were able to try out an armory of experimental treatments on patients who had no say in the matter. In drastic times, drastic measures flourished. The D-Day landings in 1944 and the war's final phase saw psychiatry taken directly into battle. For the first time, the military had planned for the possibility of huge numbers of emotional casualties. All medical officers had been trained in the treatment of battle exhaustion, and within a month, an entire psychiatric hospital was established in France. The invasion troops met fierce resistance from the Germans, and breakdown rates soared even beyond the planners' predictions. Within 10 days of landing, nearly a quarter of all casualties were psychiatric. Psychiatrists now knew they had to treat soldiers quickly before their symptoms set in. So exhaustion centers were established just behind the front. The centers had been pioneered by army psychiatrists during the fighting in Italy. On arrival, the men were washed, fed, then heavily sedated. These images have never been shown before and are still considered so sensitive that the men's identities have had to be concealed. With the help of drugs, they could rest and their symptoms of trauma might disappear. Dr. Desmond Murphy ran an exhaustion center. He told the men there was no need to be ashamed of their condition. Many of the soldiers wanted to talk because they were worried about why they broke down, how they broke down. Some of them were a little shameful of having broken down. Others were guilty about other companions or buddies who had been wounded. Guilt is a very common thing in people who survive battles or casualties. And when there is a particularly tragic happening, the guilt can become so intense that it forms part of the, the breakdown. After their deep sleep treatment, the men were put back in uniform. Military discipline was maintained. They were not allowed to forget that they were soldiers and that their comrades back at the front needed them. I had to make judgments, decisions on who to keep, who to send back. Uh, I was never fully certain that I had made the right decision. And in fact, I think I must have made the wrong decision in some cases. 
for good or for bad or for worse. <laughs> In 1945, the war ended. Five years of fighting had brought about a complete change of attitude to mental illness. The army had realized that shock and breakdown were inevitable. It now accepted that, given enough stress, every man had his breaking point. Psychiatrists had proved they could get results and in the post-war years, there would be an almost total conversion to physical treatments. In the brave new world, drugs were prescribed for almost every condition, and ECT machines hummed across the country. But some scars would never heal. For the rest of their lives, men would live with the traumatic events that had caused their illness. Bill Hooper had endured two years of hand-to-hand -hand fighting in Burma. After his best friend was shot dead beside him, he broke down completely. Even after he left hospital, he was still troubled by memories of the jungle. Coming home, everything was dead quiet. You've been used to a, a life over there where it was absolutely battered to hell. He didn't know one day from another. He was happily traumatised, as you might say. And come home, settle in the house, and the first thing I'd do is get out. It was nothing for Bill, especially if it was raining, to be in the middle of his meal. He wouldn't say anything. He just put his knife and fork down get up, go in the garden, stand in the pouring rain, come back in, sit down and finish his dinner. And that happened quite often. When I came home, the first thing I said my wife went through the front door, which she'll verify, was, have you got a carving knife? And she said, yes. I said, would you please hide it? The sole fact is, out there in Burma, we use knives. We use bayonets. So, you've got a knife. You're going to use it. If it's hidden, you can't, can you? I said, yes, I'll hide the carving knife. Well, actually, my carving knife was one of my father's butcher's knives. So I went and saw the old lady next door. He was super. And I told her. She said, I'll tell you what, she said, you knock three times on your kitchen wall and I'll come out in the garden and give you your knife. I said, right, and when I want to hand it back, I'll knock three times on the wall and you can have it back again. And that went on the whole time we lived in that house. And that must have been three or four years. And I think the tragedy of it for myself and many other people was that no one warned us what was coming home. Even now, 50 years later, memories still haunt. Thousands of veterans are still being treated for emotional wounds sustained during their war. And some traumas have lain dormant. Men who survived the war apparently unscathed are breaking down now in their old age. The final part of Shell Shock examines the traumatic effects of... These photographs 